you can have your family and also you can be educated and get the education and you can succeed it. So definitely they are they are following our footsteps. That's great to see that result. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Jen. Hi, Jennifer Burden is now joining us, too. Hi. Hi, Jen. Yeah. Hi, it's such an honor to be on this. And um, my, I'm the founder of World Moms Blog. And my question for you is, um, Dr. Abdi, is what was your biggest fear when you were running the hospital? I mean, you're such an inspiration, and you seem so fearless. But I was wondering, what was going on through your mind? <laughs> Uh, when I'm running in the camp, uh, always I'm afraid to be attacked because in 2010, Malaysian men, they attacked me, and that was disaster. Many children died, girls died, hospital was destroyed. The instrument of the hospital was also looted. So, when I am running, when I am in the hospital, I I always I afraid I I am afraid to be attacked. Mm -hmm. Jen, did you have anything? Did you hear? Actually, yes, yes. So she, so she said that she was afraid to be attacked. I can't imagine um, being in that situation. And um, if I can just ask one more um, quick one off, off of that, I wanted to know is what is her biggest message that she would like us to relay to moms around the world? I want to let the world know that uh, we have to continue to empowering women and children then we have to educate our children loyalty respect to their parents elderly and everyone in society regardless of the differences i think that will be antidote to extremism mm -hmm. the antidote to extremism yes so important and um as you know, in the U.S. here, we, we've, um, you know, felt felt the wave of terror yesterday here in Boston. So, I mean, that rings true all over the world. And great, great words. Thank you, Dr. Abdi. Okay. Christy, how about Hello. veteran journalist? <laughs> Hi, my name is Christy Wooten. I'm here in Atlanta. I'm a writer. Thanks so much for joining us today. I'm very excited to talk to you. I'm very much an activist against child marriage here in the U.S. with organizations such as CARE. So I wanted to ask you, based on your personal experiences, I remember something from the book where you talk about your father talking to a group of men who are talking about how proud they are of, his, of their sons, and he was talking about being proud of you, and then also you know, how your first marriage and those experiences shaped your view on making sure that girls marry later? Uh, girls marry later, but uh, sometimes in our society accept to marry a younger girl because the, the, the society believes that is the right way. <laughs> So, but how do you, how, how does that relate to, I guess, the health of the younger girls when, when you're sort of trying to convince them that getting married is better later, it may be better for their health or better for the outcomes, when, especially when they're giving birth so young? I always, I always uh, obey the, the 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 advice they give my parents, my father, my grandmother, my mother. We were friends. 
they were advising me always, and I was okay. obedient. Yeah? Okay, go ahead. And you I do whatever they told me, and I tell, I, I transfer the young generation <coughs> to update and listen their parents. Thank you. Uh, okay. Well, yeah, it's, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I think that, you know, one thing too, again, there's a women's education center in the camp now. Um, and so that, you know, it, there's education on a number of levels. It both provides sort of very basic education in language and in math and things like that and in basic nutrition. But one thing too is there have been different ways in which the fact that the women's education center is so attached to a hospital and so attached to, um, you know, uh, the work of doctors is both in the instances of a female genital mutilation and I think in the instances of early marriage and young childbirth, what some of the women in the education center are seeing is examples of what can happen if you do make these decisions. For example, if you do make the decision to, um, you know, as they say, is circumcise your daughter, you know, these are some of the potential birth complications that can arise as a result of that. And I think that there is also discussion in the education center about this is what can happen if you're 12 years old and you give birth. You know, this is what can happen to your daughter. Um, and so I think that, that that kind of dialogue, and again, I think it's something that has probably evolved over time, you know, that exposure. But I think that there's something so unique about the education being provided by doctors. You know, right. it's sort of different. There's there's real world examples that can be seen in a way that it's not just kind of an abstract idea. Yeah, you're right, Sarah. And then it's a tradition and culture. It's very hard to eliminate an overnight. Mm -hmm. So using the static that just uh, Sarah explained to you, the side effect, it will make them to think and reflect, okay, this is what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. so it will take a long time to, to, to eliminate the early marriage or genital female mutilation. It's a long way to go. But we started and there is a law now in, in place that prohibits <laughs> to do uh, FMG, female genital mutilation. And I hope they will learn and they will understand it's early marriage is also something they shouldn't. Thank you. Thanks, Christy. Okay, Nicole. Hi. An old friend of yeah. <laughs> Dr. Abdi. Yes. yes. Deco. Okay. Um, should I start with my question? Sure. Okay. Well, I was at, oh, I was so honored to be at the um, Minneapolis book signing. And my only regret is that I had not read this book before because I spent the last three days laying on the couch reading this book. And I mean, it's just is unbelievable. So I just want to tell you how much it touched me to read this book and hear your story, especially here in Minneapolis. We have such a large, I mean, the largest Somali population and my kids are going to school with a lot of them, so it's just really helpful. But um, there's many parts of the book that I found amazing, and I have tons of questions. But I think the biggest question I had after reading this book is just this part on um, Chapter 8 when it says, talks about your life when you're 12 years old. And I was just thinking, what if you didn't get that divorce? What would have happened? Would you have continued on to do all the amazing things you've done today? And then I kind of look at the struggles with your sisters, and they didn't go on to become doctors. So I was just kind of wondering, do you think you would have been able to continue on with school had you had stayed married at 12? And would your future have been like this? Can you hear me? Yeah, she's translating. Yes, I'm hearing you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I don't think no. I think you changed no. anything. <laughs> oh, you think you? Oh, you would have been able to continue on? She no. would not be able. I will not be able to continue because our society is very strong, and man is more privileged than women. Mm -hmm. So you are not free. 
sometimes. Well, thank you. Um, I guess it's a, it's a happy blessing then, right? Because I can't imagine, I'm sure Somali people can't imagine not having you been able to do the work you're doing. So thank you. Thank you. I always think about fate in life, and maybe it was a piece of fate then. Yep. Hopefully. I think so. We all think so. I wouldn't be here if she was married. So I'll let you move on. I could ask questions. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll get just so we can get everybody and then we'll go back. Uh, so we have Rachel with us as well. Rachel has been on a trip to Germany with the One Moms. And um, very happy that she could be here as well today. Hi, um, I'm I'm very honored. Uh, this is this is really great to be speaking with you through this Google Hangout. I think these are neat, and I'm um, I'm a, a volunteer congressional district leader for the One Campaign here in my area, and I share books all the time. So I can't wait to share your book with our community because I always go out and buy buy them and read them to talk about them. Um, and I haven't read it yet, but one of the thoughts when I was reading about you was that um, it was 30 years ago that you opened this on your land and I was wondering what what your I um, what your goals and your vision was for it at that time and what your vision is for it now as you move forward with it grown to the 90,000 people that live in it I was not expecting that time that 90,000 people will come to me. But just I opened one room clinic for a rural woman. Because at night, mid of night, or at 2 o'clock, maybe it became a labor thing. And there is no road, there is no car to reach Mogadishu. And Mogadishu is a little bit far. So I open for them to be closer. So I open for them to be closer and help them. And help them. Okay, what's your vision? How close to you? It's so soft. Go out of there. In the future, I think. He, in the future, I think. He, that my place was saved. So many my place was saved. Lives. So many lives. And uh, many children as born. And uh, many children as born. They, they have already 21 they years. They have already 21 years. So they will be the, the so they will be protected the, and know the, 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 the Somali people. And all over the world. And all over the world. Because many because many persons they come to me to visit. What I was doing. What I was doing. For example, you can see. For example, you can see the former president, the former Bush, Bush, president Bush, U.S. president, Bush, recently. Butrus, Butrus, Kali, visit me. Colin Power, come to me to Colin see. Power, come to me to see. And if I retire, and if I retire, I have, I have, I have, I have legacy. Two doctors, both doctors, two doctors, both doctors, they can run. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I love to hear your story. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Dr. Abdi, I'm Dr. Abdi, also joined by my colleague Marama. My colleague Marama will introduce you as well. She works well. very closely with Vital Voices, and we're very happy that they are such a big part of the foundation. I want to thank Vital Voices because always, because the, always the, the bad time they are with the me, helping me, giving me support morally and materially. 
Thank you, Janine. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Abdi and uh, Dr. Mohammed for all the work you're doing and the lives you've still um, And thank you, uh, Sarah, for helping to share their story uh, and their work with their work. Um, we're just so honored to have this experience uh, with you. Um, my question is uh, to do with energy or power, uh, as you know. One is beginning to One engage beginning our to members and our moms on the issue of energy poverty, which energy has a particular uh, impact uh, on women impact that on we don't think about. Don't um, having uh, run uh, uh, placement uh, camps, you know the risks women face when going out to collect firewood to cook for their families, or what it means for them to be looking out in the dark uh, with the dark, no lights at night, maybe to relieve themselves or uh, for some other purpose, and, and all the things that can happen to them. Along the way, um, with respect to your hospital, how has the lack of power, infrastructure for power um, in Somalia, affected your ability to pursue your work and running a hospital and running a surgery and uh, care for your patients and attend to their emergencies? How has that negatively impacted your work? And what would it mean for you if? Today you, you are able to access, you have able to access to power for your hospital and for your hospital. Um, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, the power is essential in Somalia, especially in our hospital, because you cannot run a hospital without power. You need to keep the reagents in the refrigerator, you want to make sure every mission is good. Temperature. You need to have a light when you're doing surgery. You need to have a light when you're giving oxygen to the kids. So the power is essential. To all of them. And most of biggest budget, uh, second biggest, the first goes to solar, and second is to water and light. So we have the generators, and we so run the generators at night time, and the daytime we run turn by time. Daytime we run by time. Generators. Generators. So we don't have centralized power. So we don't have centralized power. As a government or any uh, no the one can provide it. Right. So you have to have your own generator. So you have to have your own generator. And you have to have a system of running the generator. And you have to hire people to watch that, to watch start the generator, to work in the generator. So we, we created whole departments within the camp and within the hospital to run the, 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 the light. Uh, but one of our, my passion, and I'm taking next step into the foundation, is to find a solar panel. Because we have enough sun, we, have enough sun and we could use, uh, we could at, use at least the, the light, the light the the power, but some machines, they still uh, need the generator. Some machines, they still need the generator. Solar power cannot run some kind solar of... Solar power cannot run some kind of... Machine is that in the hospital used like uh, extra like uh, like today is solar. But uh, I think I have more faith to my team I and everyone I met. I talked about that for the last two years. One of the reasons we couldn't provide is not only the lack of finance, but the lack of engineers. In Somalia, it's broken and no one has any idea how to fix it or set up the solar panels. So since we get new government, we're hoping we have access to people, engineers can go and assist the need with electricity in hospital and the camp and set up the solar Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. We, I know we've taken up so much time already, and it's so much fun to talk with you. Are there some other questions that, or comments that any of you would like to make? I had one other question about birth certificates for girls. This is something new that I just learned about with how many girls around the world aren't accounted for because there's no birth certificate. There's, how does that work? There is no birth certificate no birth in our whole country due to the world. But we're trying to give birth certificate in our hospital, but 
the rest of the hospital, they didn't have capacity or ability to do it because they're dealing with a high turnover and low work and delivery, and they don't have the paperwork. Sometimes we run out of the papers. Sometimes we have to come back when we have a paper. But we do have a file so we do have a file where we keep every yes, child. We keep every child. You can go back and give them certificates and, and offer yeah. them what they need. Oh, but yeah. it's the issue of the whole country. It's, it's not the whole country. nation about the girl or boy in Somalia. It's the girl the in Somalia. Lack of infrastructure and any Lack of infrastructure and any Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's just so so interesting. Thank you. Thank you. So, Jan? Yeah. I just wanted to know, um, in, the, in the hospital, are the babies vaccinated or are there any types of vaccination programs for small children? Can you, can you speak a little bit louder? Can you speak a little bit louder? Yes. Are the babies vaccinated? Vaccinated? Yeah. Not all Not the time. We run out the vaccines. When we have the vaccines that give us, we vaccinate when we don't. We don't have it. Just the vaccine. Oh, so you don't have the vaccines. And even if you had the vaccines, would you have a cold place to get them? Yes, we have a cold place. 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 We And and when you do have vaccinations, in which ones do you have? Which ones do you have? Mostly in Somalia, we, 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 we give the birth at the birth. Early on, you, you don't have here, BC. You don't have here. In, uh, we do in Somalia. But if we get whole series of vaccines, now we can have first time get into vaccine. We will implement the end of this month in Somalia. Before we didn't have it, so we combined so our the vaccine. Will be found vaccines that essential. We can give one time at the birth and then later on follow up with them. It's a new system, and we're excited to have. We're excited to have. Great, thank you. Okay. Christy. Hi, I just had Hi, one I last one little last big picture, picture question, question about Somalia. About Somalia. You're right about right being a land of famine, a land of famine and war, but, war. but what is your greatest so hope, your greatest, hope? Your greatest outcome greatest for the outcome next 50 years in Somalia? Somalia? What is your greatest, what? Greatest, what? What, is your what is your greatest wish your for what you would like to see happen in your country? <laughs> <laughs> it's a big question. It's a big question. <laughs> It depends on Somali people. And how could we and help the uh, international community? Because we are suffering now poverty and the poverty, illiteracy, insecurity. That is a big issue that I don't know how we will be solved uh, short time. I think it will take time. And it, it depends how Somalis people stood up to do their own jobs and to have also friends who can help them. I cannot say this will be it will happen. Will happen if the people I I was always held up to see Somali beautiful and peaceful. And still I am continuing because my poop is keeping hope alive. Mm -hmm. uh, always I hope that every place in this world will be peaceful and uh, happy. That's what we all want. <laughs> yes. 
Sarah, I actually would have a question for you. I would love to know how you became involved in this and what's changed, you know, how has this affected you and changed you over the past two years, few years that you've been researching and visiting Somalia? Sure. Um, so I became involved uh, in this in this story uh, in 2010. I work on a contract with Glamour magazine. I uh, work on their Women of the Year Fund initiative, which each year honors uh, one grassroots activist from. It's usually an international award, or it has been historically. So, um, and we work very closely with Vital Voices and have in the past couple of years on the fundraising initiative itself, so that it's not just a story about an incredible woman, but it's a, it's a way for readers to get involved and, and give back. So in 2010, as you said, you know, we honored uh, Dr. Abdi and her daughters. Another journalist brought the story to Glamour, uh, but I, working with the magazine, uh, figured out how to get them visas to come. It was Dr. Abdi's first trip to the U.S., her first time here. Um, and so I had learned about the story kind of through the news reports, um, thought that it was so incredible, um, just sort of the scale of their work, you know, is, is as you know, is so immense. Um, and then I think that once I got, got to know them um, and saw the kind of <sighs> interpersonal part of the story, you know, the story that was not the statistics, the, the you know, the, the 90,000 people, the, 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 all of the, statistics about famine and war and, and all of the horrible kind of black and white things, but when it was really a story of a mother and two daughters and a girl growing up and, and kind of thinking about it and talking about it on that level, I realized that this, that a book would be such an incredible vehicle for the story and such an important teaching tool about Somalia and Somali history, but also just about what girls women and girls all over the world, especially in developing countries that are unstable, uh, go through. So I thought that this, you know, and it also is, unlike a lot of stories that are told, especially these days, about kind of the plight of women and girls in these situations, this is, to me, one of the most hopeful stories possible. I mean, this is a girl who came through unimaginable adversity, you know, for, for someone who grew up in the U.S. I just think, how is it even possible that you could have survived this? But yet she not only survived, but, but thrived and in a way became a leader of a kind of unimaginable magnitude in both her society and around the world. So I think that that's such an important uh, lesson for, for everybody, just that it's, you know, this is, it's, it's possible. Oh, sorry. I can't. We can't hear you. No, it's just a. Can you hear me? Yeah, now. Sorry about that. No, it's a remarkable story. It's absolutely remarkable. So, are you the one that coined the? Uh, that came up with the combination Rambo and. No, I wish. I think that was an editor. Brilliant. I know it is, and it's gotten a lot of play. So glad we do kind of. It's. Um, that's continued. No, I. I didn't, but it's. Uh, it's it's true you know there's a lot of there's so many elements to the story there's so much you know heart and and action and you know kind of you know lots now how and you I, I know you spent time you know in Somalia with with Dr. Abdi and her daughters how is that has that have changed you too and what the tra trajectory of your your career at all or your storytelling is that has that come into play Beyond you know, the book. <laughs> I actually, it's interesting, I was never able to go to Somalia. So, which is something that was, that's very complicated for me, and you can imagine as a writer, it's kind of tasked to tell the story, kind of how, how you might feel. Uh, basically, when we were working on the book in 2010, 2011, um, the situation was so unstable there that it was both, would have been a risk to me, but also a risk to the camp mm -hmm. uh, for me as, you know, kind of a Westerner, uh, to go in, you know, we didn't want to sort of create another part of the story uh, around the writing of this book. So the decision was made that we would work on it outside. Um, so I spent about two, a little over two months total over the course of two years living uh, in Nairobi, Kenya, uh, with with Dr. Abdi and and her daughters um, while they were staying there for a time. Uh, Amina, their other her other daughter, uh, has a, a women's clinic 
in East Lee, which is a huge um, Somali community inside of Nairobi. So I spent some time there um, and spent time, you know, among the Somali community there and in, um, you know, in different parts of, of the U.S. as well. So um, it was very challenging to try to write the book without seeing um, exactly what I was writing about. But I think that one thing that made it easier is the fact that Somalia has changed so much over the course of, you know, the, the really 50 plus years that this book spans. And so much of what Somalia is now is not the Somalia that was the, the Somalia of Dr. Abdi's childhood anyway. Um, so we wanted it to sort of, the, the fact that it, it exists in her memories and that kind of richness and the memories of you know, other members of the Somali community who, who I interviewed at kind of different stages. Um, that's something that I wanted to come through in the book. So things have gotten a lot better in Somalia since I turned in the manuscript. The, the month I turned it in, they had their first, in October, they had um, their first kind of free and fair elections like, yeah. in a very long time. <laughs> so the hope is that I'm going to get to go in the, in the near future. So I'm really... Oh, I hope happy. so. Me too. It would be a wonderful opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. What a remarkable story. It's just, I don't know, it's, it's, it's just incredible. I was reading uh, Elise Nelson's, uh, how she described Dr. Abdi, and it's just incredible. And it's so much, it's so poignant right now, especially that, you know, she says that Dr. Hawa Abdi embodies the resilience, compassion, and grace of the human spirit. In this poignant testament to her life's work, she reminds us that we are deeply connected and compels us to act. If we seek to create lasting peace, to preserve freedom and protect dignity, we need to stand with leaders like Dr. Abdi. It's a privilege to talk with you and to, to you know, I wish we could all be together in a group hug or something. <laughs> a virtual hug, yes. <laughs> yes. So, uh, do, do any other questions or anything that we can answer for you? Or um, Rachel, did you have? Oh, M Nicole and Rachel, both of you. And I'm I'm aware you have to go soon, so we'll just we can finish with these two if that's okay. That's great. Thank you. Okay, right, thank you very much. I'll say my thank yous now. And thank you for having us. This has been a real treat. Thank you. <laughs> across the country, all at once. <laughs> <laughs> They see the interconnectedness. I mean, it's pretty yeah. much it connects us all, and that's why you know it's, it brings us all together, and we can do so much. Uh, okay, Nicole, do you want to? Yep. Go quickly oh, I'm sorry. Nicole. I've been having some computer problems, so and my daughter's here. So sorry about all this. But real quick, what can we do here on the ground to help you? I mean, obviously in Minneapolis we have tons of Somalis. What can we do using our voice and our activism to help? I think you can do many things. One of the beginning is giving the skills and education is the key. When a woman is educated, as they say, you're educating a whole village. So we want to make sure our village, the girls have the education and power to go outside and to deliver that the rest of the country. Uh, another hand is our finance, always the difficulties to, to to pay the teachers, to pay the hospital, to continue, and, and financial always there. But we are trying to have a sustainability programs like fishing and farming, which is impossible all the time living on donation. But if we have ways to 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 make sure the foundation is sustainable, that's also another way we're looking for. So education, sustainability, and the funds always needed. That's the three more, more important points. Thank you. Thank you. Long term uh, project uh, development. development not reading, not reading. Not reading, not reading. Okay. And I did not have a question. I was sending a virtual hug. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. But thank you very much. This has been been a very, very um, inspiring conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Have thank a good you day. so much. Thanks, everybody. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you all.